Well, President Bush's political future and our economic recovery all pretty much hanging on a victory in Iraq and a sweeping one at that. Joining me now to talk about it, Newt Gingrich, the former House Speaker and a Fox News contributor. Newt, thank you for being here. I want to pick up on a point I raised with Mr. Churchill, and that is this friendship that has developed between Tony Blair and the president, uh, again, from two different ends of the political spectrum. Are you surprised to see it? Well, I'm not surprised on a couple of grounds. First of all, Tony Blair really has been a modernizing, almost, uh, uh, Paul Johnson called him uh, uh, Mar Margaret Thatcher's adopted son. I mean, he's been a much more centrist, reform-oriented, practical leader uh, than being the Labor Party prime minister would imply. Second, I think uh, Tony Blair, as much as President Bush, was deeply, deeply affected by September 11th uh, and the bombing of the New York uh, Trade Center and, and the realization that the world was unacceptably dangerous. And I think that's the big difference between the French viewpoint and the British American viewpoint. We saw Saddam Hussein as a threat. Uh, President Chirac saw Saddam Hussein as a customer. He'd been a customer for 30 years since 1973 when yeah. President Chirac sold him uh, nuclear reactors. So there's a huge difference. Tony Blair understands the world is dangerous and that we have to do something to protect ourselves against those dangers, that makes him different than the French and the Germans. Well, would you give the French and Germans a role in the rebuilding and reconstituting of Iraq? No. I would be glad to have them contribute on a humanitarian basis. I would be glad to have them participate in uh, economic activities that did not involve decisions. But I think for the United States and Great Britain uh, to go back into the Security Council where the French have the artificial advantage of a veto, for us to pretend that those who tried to prop up and defend Saddam Hussein now had a right to help shape Iraq's future, I think would be an enormous mistake and would frankly throw away much of the military victory into a diplomatic defeat. So can we just risk realigning Europe? We don't need the French, we don't need the Germans, we no, maybe think, go with that or, or no? No, it's not, it's not a question of needing or not needing. I think uh, we should cooperate when they want to be cooperative and we should not cooperate when they don't want to be cooperative. Well, they, but, say, they say we're setting the litmus test. As long as you're cooperative with the U.S., fine. If you're not, then we, we say screw you and that's not fair. What do you say? No, 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 I, we don't say screw you. We simply say we'd be glad to find other things to cooperate on, but Having had our young men, British and American young men and women, risk their lives, having taken all the risk, having carried on despite the best efforts of the French to stop us, it is a bit much to now be lectured by those who would have sustained Saddam on their right to do anything after this victory. And I think it's a big mistake okay. psychologically for us to give in to that. All right. Newt, another one is not invited at a French restaurant. Newt Gingrich, <laughs> good seeing you again. Thank you very much. Good to see you. As we wait for confirmation if Saddam was killed in Monday's big blast, would that be the signal that war is over? Let's ask retired Marine Colonel Bill Cowan and in Minneapolis, retired Army Colonel Joe Repia. Uh, Colonel Cowan, to you first. Let's say we get proof he's dead. Is it over? Not over, Neil. Uh, I think all we have to do is remember that we uh, essentially defeated the Taliban in Afghanistan, and yet they're still out there fighting. I'm a Vietnam vet. I'm reminded that even in April of 75, when the North Vietnamese secured their victory in Saigon over the South, that indeed some South Vietnamese elements, disparate, unorganized, but still armed, fought on for almost four years. So Saddam may be dead. The war's a long way from being over. Colonel Rep, do you agree? Well, I do. I, I think what's going to happen is uh, if Saddam is, in fact, dead, what will emerge is someone that will take leadership of the regime. And if they're smart, they're going to try to uh, contact the United States and say, look, we'll, uh, we'll call an immediate ceasefire. We'll uh, surrender all our forces, and you please take me into custody. Because if they don't, when the Iraqi people get their hands on them, they know what's going to happen. So I think if they're really smart, that's what they'll do. Uh, as far as fighting on with Saddam being dead, I, I don't see that scenario playing out very long. It might play out for a while. Uh, Colonel Cowan, one option that's been raised is the fact that uh, we wouldn't know how this war would end, whether you got a confirmation of Saddam's death, but you could still have some vigilantes in there who want to keep carrying on, as you said, in the case of the South Vietnamese for, for years. So how do you get closure on this, or do you? Uh, Neil, I, I, I'm sure that's a question that uh, the White House, the Pentagon, and CENTCOM are all struggling with, because uh, for all we know, we'll find indeed tomorrow or the next day that Saddam is dead, but realistically, those guys on the front lines are going to have to be fighting. It's not only these 
organized forces which may become somewhat disorganized. We know that there were uh, at least thousands of volunteers to come into the city uh, as uh, suicide bombers and we're going to have these acts of terrorism. So while the real war, the actual war against Republican Guard or Special Republican Guard or other people that were part of the constituted military or government may be gone. I, we, we're still going to be facing uh, these absolute radicals from, from wherever they may come outside Iraq or inside Iraq who are going to pose a problem for us and it's something we're going to have to deal with even as we're working through our humanitarian issues. Now, if he's right, Colonel Repia, then the market, and that's my little uh, corner of the world, has said if we get confirmation that Saddam is, is dead, that's a 500-point rally right there. Now, you're, well, saying, you're, so. you're, you're, you're saying that it potentially could be short life, though. Well, it, once again, uh, you have an army that just three weeks ago had 800 tanks. Today they have less than 20. Many of those tanks were abandoned on, on the battlefield because they knew that staying in them meant certain death. Now, some of his soldiers have just gone home, and many of them have blended into the society again. However, there will be hardcore irregulars that will try to fight a guerrilla warfare for a period of time. Once we get in there, once we stabilize things and we get the, the civilians uh, fed and, and uh, on our side, once, or so to speak, uh, they'll root those people out and identify them for us, and, and peace will eventually come to the Iraqi Who's to say they will, though? I mean, we've seen anecdotal evidence, and Colonel Cowan, I'll pick this up with you, that a lot of those civilians do not, either out of fear or they just really want to wait until they know for sure, or they just hate the United States a lot more than they do Saddam. How do you deal with that? Well, Colonel Neil, Collins? you know, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just step back and say that uh, we, we, you know, we're, we're totally focused on Iraq right now. And I, want, I agree with uh, Colonel Repio on some of these things that are going to happen with respect to uh, the organization being gone. But w we look outside Iraq. We're all focused on Iraq. Look outside Iraq at the intense hate and animosity that we've created. Uh, we don't, we're sorry it's that way, but that's the way it is for now and maybe for a while. And that's going to foment and create problems for us, not only in Iraq, but outside. So we should all hope Saddam is dead. We should hope the major engagements end, that indeed the civilian population for the most part is with us. But against that backdrop, we're still going to have concerns. All right, Colonel Cowan, final word on the subject. Colonel Repi, I want to thank you as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank both. you very much, Neil. Well, we strike them there. They're going to strike us here. Well, we have struck them there. So far, nothing here. Why my next guest says it's because bin Laden's been grounded. He's going to explain the terror threat that we're all worried about that might not be a threat. Stick around. Welcome back, everyone. Again, we've been emphasizing here, still no word on whether Saddam is dead or alive, but now defense officials say that someone is giving orders to what's left of his Republican Guard. For the latest, let's check in with Major Garrett at the Pentagon. Hey, Major. Hey, good afternoon, Neil. And here's the latest take from the Pentagon on this strike on what is described as an opportunistic leadership target. Senior defense official just telling Fox a couple of moments ago, look, we hit what was targeted. The question now is, how good was the intelligence that led us to that target? Of course, those were the same questions that loomed on March 19th when that first target was hit, a command and control leadership target, we were told, that quite possibly then could have successfully ended the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. It didn't then. The big difference between these two targets, this one hit yesterday, not reinforced in a civilian area, the first one heavily reinforced. The evidence of the damage of this aerial bombardment all too visible in the Al-Mansur section of western Baghdad. It is located between, as it happens, two places where coalition for forces have been roaming around rather freely. The Baghdad International Airport to the east and the new presidential palace on the west. Now, coalition forces do not control this particular area, the Al-Mansur area, but Fox News has learned that coalition forces at this hour are getting some help on the ground. What kind? Well, senior officials won't be specific. They say it could be U.S. operatives or friendly Iraqis. Whichever, this help could allow coalition forces to learn a little bit sooner exactly what happened when that, those bombs made this crater in the Al-Mansur area. And it may, they may learn so long before coalition forces start digging through the rubble themselves. Neil, here is how it happened. In broad daylight, a B-1B bomber and its four-man crew flew 200 miles in less than 12 minutes after receiving urgent orders to leave their position high in the skies in far western Iraq and deliver four bombs on a key leadership target. The word from the radar command plane in the sky that delivered these orders? This could be the big one. The B-1B pilots know they hit their target, striking with four joint direct attack munitions. Two of those munitions were titanium reinforced, and that means they were capable of burrowing at least 10 feet underground before exploding. 
But did Saddam perish? The Pentagon says it doesn't know. What it does know is Saddam, at least until yesterday, still retained some ability to direct his most ardent and notorious armed supporters against coalition forces. He still controls elements of the Special Republican Guard and death squads, and his role as military commander and dictator, moral leader of that regime, he and a, a group of others probably militarily are key at that point, as much as they can exert any kind of influence, even if it's limited in Baghdad, and we'd like to reduce that. Also, on the issue of journalists operating in Baghdad, clearly they're at a high degree of risk and peril. Two journalists died after a U.S. Army tank fired one round into the upper floors of the Palestine Hotel. The Pentagon said a sniper was firing at the tank from the roof or the upper floors of that very hotel. Journalists in the hotel, however, said they were aware of no snipers. The Pentagon expressed its condolences but said all of Baghdad is in fact a war zone and journalists run huge risks as they work in the capital city. I personally have probably had 300 individual conversations with news organizations and bureau chiefs and some individual correspondents. And the essence of every one of those is war is a dangerous, dangerous business and you're not safe when you're in a war zone. Neil, here's some other key facts on the ground as far as Baghdad is related. Now armored forces of the 5th Corps have sealed off the northern part of Baghdad. They don't completely encircle the whole city, but most of the main roads are now covered by heavily reinforced coalition forces. That means leadership and the Iraqi regime can't escape even if they chose to try. Another important thing, for the first time in the history of this short conflict, the Iraqis successfully shot down a coalition aircraft, a heavily reinforced A-10 Warthog. They did that with a surface-to-air missile, and that means they retained some limited capability of shooting down coalition aircraft. Aircraft supremacy over the skies of Baghdad is now at least marginally in question, and there is still significant opposition, though pockets of it, throughout the capital city. Suppressing that, it appears to be, is the job of the Marines, the Army, and quite possibly may be undermined entirely if we're word spreads that in fact Saddam Hussein was in this compound and was felled once and for all by this coalition airstrike. You know, that's the latest from the Pentagon. Back to you in New York. Thank you, Major, very much. Major Garrett at the Pentagon. Well, a war with Iraq will breed more terror. You heard the argument again and again before the war started. You're still hearing it now, but my next guest just isn't buying it, and he wasn't buying it back then. Joining us now is Daniel Pipes. He's the director of the Mideast Forum in Philadelphia. Daniel, good to have you back. Thank you, Neil. You're saying that um, we're over worrying? Yes, I think, well, uh, let's take a prominent uh, analyst, uh, the president of Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, who said that the current war in Iraq is leading to not one bin Laden, but a hundred bin Ladens. I don't see it. And my best proof is to go back to Afghanistan, when the similar sort of thing was being said, that uh, the war in Afghanistan would breed immense hostility to the United States, and it didn't happen. There was hostility at the time of the hostilities, and then when we won, it uh, dis diminished precipitously. And I'm expecting something similar to happen, both as we win and as it becomes apparent that the Iraqi people are delighted by their being liberated. But let's say it's not a matter of decreased hostility, which might in fact be the case, Daniel, but the fact that we're better at policing the real hostility. Well, in part, yes, we have become much more proficient at uh, protecting ourselves. But, but the, the key point that is so much worrying people is the fact that there is this very, very uh, hostile atmosphere towards the United States, uh, especially in the Muslim world. And I don't dispute it. I just say, let's wait a couple of months and see after the liberation of Iraq, after a new Iraqi government takes over control of its oil fields, after the casualties turn out not to be that large, let's see if that hostility still continues. My expectation is that it won't. All right, so these, these demonstrations that we've seen in other Arab countries uh, where they, they express solidarity with Saddam against the great infidel of the United States, you think those are overblown, that in reality in time they'll come to our way of thinking? I'm not so much saying they're overblown as that they're transient. Um, they are of the moment. And that's why I refer back to October and November of 2001 when there was the hostilities in Iraq, in Afghanistan, sorry. If you go back and read what people were saying at that time, you see this 
similar kind of prediction. In fact, using almost the same words, that there'll be a hundred bedlands coming out of this, that the fury at the United States will not abate, and, and just simply didn't happen. In fact, what happened was, as the United States was winning, and as Afghans started to show their gratitude for it, uh, Muslim rage dissipated. I expect something similar this time. All right, now, as you know, Daniel, better than most, I mean, all you need is an errant nut somewhere in this country trying to pull off a stunt akin to what Hezbollah or Hamas does in Israel then uh, all bets are off, right? I mean, that is still very much a real wild card, right? Well, sure. I'm not predicting there won't be any violence at all. I can't do that. I'm, I'm talking about this uh, fear at the moment that a huge backlash against the United States is brewing and that we are building our own enemies in this war and that these enemies will be around for years to come and they're proliferating. It's, it's, I'm not talking about the individual nut. I'm talking about you know, large numbers of deeply hostile enemies to the United States. I don't see that being bred in this conflict. Do you think uh, Osama is, is still alive? Oh, I don't know, but uh, it would seem not. Uh, it would seem that he would have had more communications, but, uh, you know, it's pure speculation. All right. I, but, the, you know, the important thing, Neil, is the fact that it's not terribly important whether he's alive or not. It's What's a good important point is that this war is being won by the United States and its allies. And Daniel, I should have listened to you at the outset because you were saying the exact same thing when everyone was freaking out. All right, Daniel Pipes, thank Thanks. you very much. Good seeing you. Well, the thank latest you. on Saddam, dead or alive, and a market watch who insists, just like Dan, for stock traders, it really doesn't matter. All that and the latest twist on SARS. Some people have it and don't even know it. What a mess that's going to cause after this. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Neil Cavuto. Very glad to have you joining us on your world. Here's the latest on Operation Iraqi Freedom. The end game is near. That is the latest from the Pentagon. Officials say that Republican Guard is no longer an effective fighting force. Still, the Pentagon warns that Iraq's command structure is partially intact and members of this special Republican Guard and death squads are still active. Some evidence of that today. At least 50 Iraqi fighters were reported killed in a battle with coalition forces to secure bridges over the Tigris River. Oil prices picking up. OPEC is expected to cut production at a meeting on March 24th. I believe that is the 24th of this month. The cartel is trying to keep prices in the 25 to uh, $26 a barrel range. Oil prices hitting a four-month low yesterday on the belief that the war could be over very soon and the economies for the rest of the world are kind of mis a -mis, so there's not much demand. And call it the coalition of the unwilling. French President Jacques Chirac and UN Secretary General Kofi Annan are expected to travel to St. Petersburg this weekend to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin and German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder. France, Germany, and Russia have all been against the war since day one and they haven't changed their tune. And they may make the ultimate sacrifice. Today, the bodies of 11 British soldiers being returned home to England, five were Royal Navy lieutenants who were killed when two Sea King helicopters collided. The remaining six were killed in a friendly fire incident when an American A-10 tank buster fired on two British armored vehicles. Well, what if the Republican Guard surrenders by Friday? Then what? Well, if my next guests on the stock market are right, it could be big, very big. With us now is Michelle Girard, the bond market strategist over Prudential Financial, Gary Kaltbaum, the president of Kaltbaum & Associates, and senior business correspondent Brenda Butner. Uh, Michelle, to you first on the bond market. How would it take that news since a lot of people worry about interest rates. Well, it's absolutely the true that when we've seen optimism over a speedy end to the war take hold, Treasury yields have moved higher. You know, Treasury market and bonds have benefited from all the uncertainty about war. We've seen Treasury prices go up as a result. You see that reverse when when rates uh, when when the war may be over. But I will say that you know the focus will very quickly shift back to the economy, and of course, the economy doesn't look so great here in February and March, and so any rise in interest rates that we do say is probably going to be fairly limited over the near term. Gary, what happens if we get confirmation Saddam's dead? Uh, look, there is nothing more I'd rather see than to find one of his grimy fingers in the rubble. Uh, I have the sneaking suspicion the market may have already acted on the good news we've been hearing. Evidence by yesterday, we had a 250 point up morning on good news and it couldn't hold it. It tells me in the near term, I don't think there's much upside. Maybe we pop a little bit if he's found, but I think we end up in a trading range. And as Michelle said, and she's exactly right, we get back to fundamentals. That's going to be earnings, valuations, directions of interest rates and that's going to be fun all right and that's what you've argued is not looking all too great right now right 
Uh, the economy is getting by. I'm still worried about valuations. And if you notice the warnings that have been coming out the last few days, they are, in, they are not a pretty sight. When you see Hewlett Packard a couple of months ago miss revenues by 500 million, Intel cutting yeah. CapEx by 25%, uh, uh, those are all worrisome signs. The good news is the market's going to start trading on the future. And if things start to pick up, things could get better. But I am not in this camp. I'm hearing a lot of people okay. talking about new bull markets Gary, and 25%. I don't mean uh, I'm sorry, Gary. I don't mean to interrupt Go you. Ahead. We're watching the President of the United States returning from Ireland here. This is at Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, Air Force One is now back on U.S. soil here after what was a whirlwind meeting, his third uh, powwow with uh, Tony Blair and I guess in as many weeks. Uh, uh, Brenda, but I want to pick up on that point of the president, how he is seen here. Markets generally like strong leaders, be they Democrat or Republican. Markets don't seem to show much discretion. How do you think if the war goes well, the president will be viewed, and then ultimately the economy. Oh, he has tremendous political capital now, and I think he knows that he's going to use it. I mean, he's he's already focusing on the economy. There uh, rarely does a day go by that he doesn't mention it, and and he knows that the front line is the economy. It's not just in Iraq, and I think he's going to use this to push his tax cut forward. I think that uh, tax cut will go through. It may not go through a hundred percent as he had hoped, but um, look, he's the commander in chief and he's going to act uh, act quickly and uh, I think that's exactly what he needs to do. Michelle Gerard, do we risk the possibility of interest rates going back up in other words people trying to lock in those mortgages or refinancings seeing a backlash because of the president's tax cut if he gets a lot of what he wants. Well, you're exactly right. I mean, not only may we see a, a decline in the demand for Treasury bonds once the war is over, but we are going to be faced with a huge amount of Treasury supply as a result of the fact that budget deficits now are expected to top $400 billion just this fiscal year. And that is going to put some upward pressure on interest rates. I mean, ultimately, the level of rates are going to be determined by how the economy fares post-war. And that really is going to be uh, the decisive question. Unfortunately, we probably aren't going to know the answer to that until we get a couple of months of economic data after the war. We probably won't know how the economy fares until sometime this summer. And if it does well, then even, um, you know, even if the economy does well, then what we're going to see is Treasury yields move higher, not only because of supply, but also because the fundamentals are better. Gary, real quickly, you agree with that? Uh, a little bit. I think Treasury yields can back up, but I don't see this big giant move to the upside. There's still a ton of excess capacity out there in the world. There's enough airplanes in Mojave Desert for the next 10 years, and that's just symptomatic of a lot of things I see. So, yeah, they can back up a little bit. I don't see it too much. All right, Gary, final word on the subject. Brenda Button, I want to thank you. Michelle Gerard, thank you as well. All right, directly ahead, Basra has been a thorn in the coalition side since the start of the war. The latest as your world rolls on. The President of the United States, meanwhile, returning to U.S. soil. Now arriving at Andrews Air Force Base after a busy whirlwind trip in which he met with Tony Blair to discuss, among other things, how to rebuild Iraq and who does the rebuilding. More news. Fox News Channel first. We've got the city sealed off by U.S. military. The city is ours. The latest on the war. Live Fox News Channel. Real journalism. Fair and balanced. Welcome back, everyone. You know, we're always so focused on Baghdad, Baghdad, Baghdad. It's a big country. You know, there's other stuff going on there besides Baghdad. Now with the latest on the fighting in the southern Iraqi city of Basra, we go live to Kuwait City, where you'll find our Adam Housley. Adam. That's right, Neil. Basra, of course, the second largest city. Now, we moved down here to the, basically the ground force headquarters about 25 miles south of Kuwait City to get more information today on the Basra situation. And what we're being told by the British is that Basra is secure, but there are still scenes like this. Hotels looted, even a hospital looted in recent days. British forces surrounded the city basically three weeks ago. Then they've gradually closed in. That's been their M.O. But there were pockets of resistance around Basra and even now periodic fighting. But the city, they say, is in their hands and the humanitarian effort soon to follow as the south becomes a safer place. Now, also in this region, the Iraqi in charge of Saddam's forces in the south, like around Basra, may not be dead. The coalition believes they got him this time. It's the fourth attack to try and get the guy who, by the way, is also Saddam's cousin, Chemical Ali, getting his chemical tag after ordering the use of chemicals on Iraqi Kurds, killing scores back in 1988. When Chemical Ali, as you refer to him, house was taken out, and that was a critical precondition 
to the entry into Basra because that took out the brain. And warfare is about taking out the brain and the head of any organization. When that was achieved, that was achieved through local Iraqi human intelligence telling us which house he was in. Again, Neil, they believe they got him, but no guarantee because they haven't found the body yet. As for the rest of the South, the humanitarian aid effort is continuing. The convoy is going in. Yesterday, we had a chance to dock in Umm Qasr, Iraq, in the South, as they brought in 250 tons of rice, tea, as well as a water purification system. An interesting point there, too, as we come back here live, is some of the workers on the shore, also in the tugs helping the boat come in, were actually Iraqis that just a few weeks ago were working for Saddam Hussein. Neil? All right. Uh, one thing I'm not quite sure of is, is how the Kuwaitis, more to the point, are responding to this. I mean, we've heard that they're, they obviously want Saddam out of there. What was their reaction earlier on to reports we might have already killed him? Well, the Kuwaitis are like a lot of people here in the Arab part of the world, in fact, the Gulf Coast countries, they like to see Saddam go, but until they actually see him, Neil, until they see the body, until they get confirmation from a Western television or media outlet, they still kind of believe he has a little bit of a, of a, of a they call him nine lives, actually. Until they see him, they don't see him dead, see him captured, they, they're not going to believe that he's actually out of the picture yet, Neil. All right, Adam Housley, thank you very much in Kuwait City. Well, tanks rolling across Baghdad and soldiers tearing through palace doors. you got to wonder if these are the images the Arabs will associate Americans with in the future. Well, the State Department has already thought about that, so it has now come up with a plan to help win the hearts and minds of people over there. A magazine. Joining us now to explain is Richard Crichton. He is the principal of the magazine group, which will, which will design and edit this publication. Sir, good to have you. Thanks for having me, Neil. Now, who's the target audience? The target audience is Arab youth between the ages of 18 to 35 in 22 Middle Eastern countries. All right, and what are you going to be saying with this magazine? Well, the, the purpose of the magazine uh, is to try to bridge this great divide that has developed over the years and uh, to focus on, on culture. There's certainly a number of magazines today in the Arab world that are about fashion or that are about policy and politics, but we believe that the basis of people's formation is really culture and that there are a number of points that we have in common between our two cultures. We've, we've tended to focus away from them and we'd like to help people focus back on what we do have in common. Now still there's a great deal of illiteracy through that region of the world. Uh, is this just reaching just a few people? Well, it's certainly reaching people uh, who can read. I think that there, um, there actually is a, a fast-growing segment of this age group that uses the uh, internet, that, that reads, that is educated. So uh, we have to speak to the people that we can communicate with in writing and electronically first. Will people instantly identify this though, as an American publication, Richard? From the get-go, you might want, you, they might not even turn the cover. Well, actually, the, the title, the working title of the magazine is Hi, which uh, our research shows is a very commonly used greeting in the Middle East among youth of this age. Uh, so the, the cover will have the word hi and uh, the rest of the titles will be in Arabic. So there will be a sense that this is a different kind of publication that's eye-catching, that stands out from other publications on the newsstand. Give me an idea of the type of stories you'd have that would present us, that is the coalition, the United States more to the point, in a friendly face. Uh, actually what we're focusing on more is uh, areas that, uh, that we have in, that are important to both Americans and Arabs. Uh, an example of this is education. The UN, uh, United Nations study showed recently that education is the top of Arab youth concerns. And uh, that's certainly true in the United States. So one of our first stories will be uh, East Coast versus West Coast American universities, the experience of Arab youth at those universities uh, to show what the experience is like and how education uh, is different, but really to, to give people a sense of, of life here that they might not see otherwise uh, in, in, through other Arab media. All right, we'll see how this goes. Richard Creighton, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, my next guest says this magazine is a waste of time, that Americans need to be better educated on Arabs, not the other way around. Joining us now is Osama Siblani. He's the editor of Arab American News in Detroit. Sir, thanks for coming. You think this whole effort of the uh, last guest was just a waste, huh? It is a waste. I, I think we should speak to the Arab uh, uh, people, um, but I think it's equally important that we listen to them as well. 
And it is important that we do this exchange not through the State Department and through the foreign ministries of the Arab uh, countries, but it should be done through universities, through uh, uh, think tank centers. I think we should exchange this kind of culture. But you know, one thing is he did not mention is the people in the Middle East, especially in the ages that he mentioned between 18 and 35, they are well versed of the American culture. I, mean, I can tell you that my nephews overseas, for example, they know the basketball players uh, by names, uh, their salaries, their scores. I mean, you know, well, do they like really, it? Do they like us or do they hate us? Yes, yes, of course. Yes, who of course. Who likes us and who like... hates us? Well, I think all of the Arab world like Americans, but they just hate what the America has been doing on the foreign policy front. Now, we have to distinguish, make a clear distinction between our country inside and our country outside. There is a face to America, to the outside, that has been really damaged pretty bad. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, Mr. Pipes, when you were talking to him, I was hearing, uh, he is underestimating the anti-Americanism that has reached a dangerous level in the world, and in particular in the Middle East. So what's the best way around that? If not this magazine, how do we make the world stop hating us? I, I said at the beginning of, of, the, sh of uh, the interview that we really need to listen to the people. They have been talking for a long time, whether they're in the street demonstrating, whether they're commentators, their media outlets. They have been screaming for justice. They have been screaming for wealth distribution. You know, we're talking about the Middle East, the richest region in the world, and yet there's lots of poor people there. Yeah, and but in Iraq, talking, in, you, in, Iraq, talk, in Iraq, Osama, who, 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 whose fault is that? I mean, they've been ruled by well, a dictator Iraq, who has gold-plated bathrooms. You know, I'm going to... I'm going to say something that, you know, you, you, you're probably are going to misunderstand and, and other people are going to misunderstand. In Iraq, health care is free. Education is free. I'm not saying that Saddam Hussein is a nice guy. He's a brutal dictator. But we have to talk about it. Yeah, he builds ballot palaces, uh, huge palaces uh, in, in Iraq. But look, other dictators in the region who happen to be our friends, they have bigger, huger palaces, and their people are poor, and they have palaces not only in Saudi Arabia or in Kuwait or in, in the UAE or in Qatar, but all over the world. But they that's a good point. Then what would you say of, of the kind of r r warm response a lot of our soldiers have gotten uh, as they pass through Iraq? Not everywhere, but enough I, confidence building in a part of a lot of Iraqis that you know, ding dong, the witch is dead sort of thing. And they're, they're very happy about it. Well, I am sure that they're happy right now to get rid of Saddam Hussein, but trust me, they will not be happy to see American forces if America is going to continue its foreign policy the way it has been conducting itself in the last 50 years or 56 years. Let, let, us, let us be very clear in here. There is no hate between the American people and the Arab people or the Muslim world. There is no hate. There is hate for the foreign policy. They see the outside face of America not the inside. Okay. All, of, all of the Arab world in the Middle East, they have good relationship with the American people. They receive them well. Ask Americans who visit overseas. And okay. you see the kind of hospitality that they are extended because they are Americans. All right. Osama Samblani, thank you. I appreciate it very much of Arab American Thank you, news. Neil. We well, already know the Department of Homeland Security is working hard to protect our shores, but what can you do to protect yourself? You won't believe what the big three automakers are doing after this. Well, bullets flying over there, terror warnings flying over here. It's enough to make you wish you could get around like James Bond. Well, guess what? Now, apparently you can. Steve Brown with the details from our Chicago Bureau. Steve. Neil, for the right price, you can. This is auto safety way past airbags and crumple zones. We're talking about vehicles for the super security conscious buyer. Cars that rework the term armored car. The president of the United States has one. So does the vice president and the secretary of state. And if you have the money, you can have a car like theirs that stops bullets. By late this year, every one of the big three American automakers will offer armored autos, beefed up luxury sedans with bullet resistant glass and thick steel plating. Our clientele is, is basically comprised of um, sports figures, celebrities, um, high profile people, individuals from corporations. Joe Scaletta is the president and CEO of Scaletta Mahoney, the company that has partnered with Cadillac to turn out an armored version of the DeVille. The way it would work is you would go to a, a Cadillac dealer and order a vehicle and have an armor option. 
and it's an expensive option. Whether it is the Cadillac, the new armored Lincoln Town Car, also out later this year, or Daimler Chrysler's already available Mercedes S500, all three cost well above $100,000. Dealers believe there is a market for this kind of vehicle. 9-11 changed the world, basically, and it changed the way people buy cars and look at purchasing. And we think from a safety standpoint, there's going to be people interested in it. But as impressive as the tests look, a word of caution. There is no such thing as bulletproof. It, all, all an armored vehicle really does is buy you time to get out of the situation. And Scaletta says that could be as little as just 10 extra seconds to get out of that trouble. So it's a very high price to avoid some would-be terrorist or an armed kidnapper. But those bad guys are out there, and the big three automakers believe that there will be people out there willing to buy a high-end, high-security luxury car. Neil? Steve Brown, Chicago. Thank you, sir, very much. The telling of a lie again and again after this. Listening to this Iraqi minister, Mohammed Saeed al Sahaf, I'm reminded of the story about the wife who comes home to find her husband in bed with another woman. Honey, he screams, it's not what you think. As if you can explain away a situation like that with something like, she was here to test out the mattress. Look, it doesn't work. The gig's up. Imagine being al Sahaf. Coalition troops are within yards of him, and he conducts daily briefings assuring anyone with a near shot the infidel has been destroyed. A couple of days ago, he was saying the airport in Baghdad was safely under Iraqi control, even as coalition troops were repaving runways. Then on word that coalition forces had stormed one of Saddam's palaces, he insisted it was all lies that Americans were nowhere near Baghdad. The infidels, he said, are committing suicide by the hundreds on the gates of Baghdad. He talks of Iraqis in full control, but has trouble speaking over the pounding of bombs of coalition aircraft. With a straight face he conducts a briefing outside assuring all coalition aircraft have been stopped even as they fly overhead and columns of smoke fill the air behind him this guy screams a saturday night live skit but clearly there's a method to his madness keep telling a lie long enough and people believe you maybe like that husband desperately hoping his wife might buy the story that the babysitter was tired honey so i thought i took her in i just wonder what happens when baghdad does fall i'll give sahaf credit though unlike others he uh, has not turned tail and run. He might be like Detective Clouseau, but he is entertaining. Saddam Hussein, dead or alive? That's the question hovering over Baghdad after a U.S. bomber tries to bury the Iraqi leader with four bunker buster bombs. But no sign of Saddam yet. At the bottom of the pile, has the Iraqi leader and the Iraqi leadership been crushed in the Baghdad suburbs? Hi, everybody. I'm John Gibson. The big story, no stopping the relentless push by coalition forces as we consider the fate of Saddam Hussein, some fierce fights and major gains in the capital of Iraq. A live report now from Fox correspondent Heather Nauer in Amman, Jordan. Hi, Heather. Hi there, John. First up today, troops moving farther into the city of Baghdad today and also confirmation of airstrikes against a building where Saddam Hussein and his sons were believed to be meeting. In addition to that, booby trapping the city of Baghdad. It's believed that Iraqis are doing that, proving that Baghdad is certainly not a safe place yet. But first up, the hunt for Saddam Hussein, a B-1 bomber today targeting a meeting place where he was believed to be meeting with his sons and at least 20 members of Iraqi leadership. The building was in a residential neighborhood. Eyewitness intelligence indicated that someone who looked like Hussein entered the building. No word yet on whether the group made it out, and it'll be days, possibly weeks, before we get final confirmation as to exactly who was in that building yesterday. Now, on the ground today, troops moving closer into the heart of Baghdad. The Army's 3rd Infantry Division moving farther into the city, testing out today the Republic Bridge, which stretches over the Tigris River. And also the Marines pushing closer into the city from the east today, taking, out, or taking over the Rashid military airfield. 
Also today, an A-10 Warthog attack fighter was shot down near Baghdad Airport by a surface-to-air missile. The pilot ejected and is safe. Now, this plane is known for providing some of these low-flying urban air attack missions, basically protection from the sky to help protect troops on the ground, and that is going on 24 hours a day now. Now, not all is safe for coalition forces in Baghdad. The Iraqis have previously claimed that they'd use non-conventional weapons to fight. U.S. soldiers finding evidence of that in Baghdad this week. According to military sources, Iraqis are trying to slow coalition advance by setting booby traps in the city of Baghdad. We're talking about stringing de decapitation wires across streets and even rigging grenades to fire on cars that happen to pass by certain roads and streets. Now, today turned deadly for three journalists covering the war. First, the office of Al Jazeera, the Arab television network, was the target of a believed airstrike after U.S. commanders came under fire. Now, it was, they believed that the fire was coming from that building. One of Al Jazeera's correspondents was killed in that. Now, also, snipers firing on coalition forces from the nearby Pal Palestine Hotel. That's the hotel where all the journalists in Baghdad are required to stay. A tank returned fire on what it believed was, was a sniper. Two journalists were killed and two others were injured. Now, John, by now you've probably heard in the Arab world that lots of folks, in particular in Iraq, have been basically asking Arabs from around the Arab world to join in on the fight to help fight coalition forces. Forces. Well, according to a report here today, a group of lawyers from Egypt is signing up these people, signing up additional jihadis to go into Baghdad. I think that's pretty interesting. John, that's the latest here from Amman, Jordan. Back to you in New York. Heather Nauer in Amman. Heather, thank you very much. To the south of Baghdad, Basra is free with British troops setting up shop and thankful civilians tearing down reminders of Saddam Hussein. Elsewhere, Iraqi opposition troops have a new role and there are pockets of new resistance popping up. Correspondent Adam Adam Hasley has more from Kuwait City. Hi, Adam. Hey, John, that's right. Basra is free, but there are still some problems. Now, we're here at Coalition Land Force Headquarters, which is about 25 miles south of Kuwait City, and the word is, at least from the British, that Basra is secured. That's the latest. Now, after three weeks, basically, Basra was uh, being secured by British forces. They were around it. It's the second largest city in Iraq and the site of sporadic opposition, including Iraqi soldiers shooting at their own people a week or so back. Now, the British battle plan all along has basically been to surround the city and to gradually close in, and that's what they've done to secure it. Now, also in the area, the coalition is saying that they had a chance to meet with the sheik from around Basra. He is going to help them with their efforts there. But while Basra may have improved, there are still some problems and scenes of looting and stealing and random fights as the city and its people that have been beaten down by Saddam's forces for a number of years still deal with the difficult areas and a now loosened grip. Not far from Basra now, Iraqi opposition leader Ahmad Shalabi has arrived in the city of Nasiriyah to join the fight to help liberate Iraq. Now, Shalabi, of course, is best known as one of the leaders of the Iraqi National Congress, an organization, of course, that has yet to pull all their factions together, and a man who has somewhat have a troubled relationship with the U.S. State Department. Shalabi says there are now 700 Iraqi fighters prepared to fight on the side of the coalition, and coalition troops apparently are helping them do that. Now, and the fight uh, moves from Basra and that area up towards Hilo, where it continues there. Forces on the edge, really, of the city, where some heavy gun battles continue overnight and into the day. Tanks and warplanes from the U.S. Uh, really pounding and battering Iraqi positions as they continue to move north. John, one more thing, as we talk about uh, Shalabi, as we talk also about Basra and in the areas like Hilla in the southern region of this country, when they do become secured, the interim government, which is coming basically from here in this part of Kuwait, they're meeting here at this location, heading into the south. Eventually, that will, they will go to Baghdad once it too is secure. But the key with all this movement is the security aspect. Once the south gets better then Baghdad, they will continually move north and help rebuild this country. John? Adam Housley in Kuwait City. Adam, thanks very much. The bombing aimed at Saddam Hussein last night left a huge crater in Baghdad, but the Iraqi leader has a vast network of underground quarters, including bunkers to des designed to withstand a nuclear attack. Jora Shamas is editor-in-chief of Debka.com, a website dealing with military affairs. Mr. Shamas, uh, what do we know about the uh, tunnels, the bunkers that are underground in Baghdad? 
Well, uh, there is a labyrinth or a network of tunnels that are uh, connecting or con uh, actually there are uh, three, four, even five command cities and the tunnels and the um, and the underground uh, roads actually are connecting each, each of them. Is it possible that Saddam Hussein could have gone into this building yesterday, as, as intelligence said he did, and the Americans came in within 12 minutes, uh, brought a B-1 bomber in and dropped these four 2,000-pound bombs, and he escaped by some underground route? Well, that's of course always a possibility because uh, the place that was bombed, was bombed is actually an entrance to such a command city. And, but it's very unlikely from all kind of sources here down in the Middle East that he actually came out of one of the bunkers if he was there at all. Why is it unlikely? Uh, it's uh, unlikely that in such a situation when there are so much uh, uh, intelligence or uh, airwax planes and uh, other sort of uh, intelligence equipment flying all over that he will move out of his idol. And uh, I, it's hardly to believe that in a situation where American tanks are rolling in the streets and over the bridges, that he will take this, such a risk. So you think that uh, even if there were bunkers under there, that this bombing may actually have killed him? I, we don't know, nobody knows actually, and maybe the Americans have been just, uh, had a good luck and he really was there and they really hit him or one of his sons. That's a possibility uh, that we shouldn't rule out. But uh, it's, uh, the, the, the main point is actually if you will look at the labyrinth of the tunnels and the underground uh, uh, roads, it's actually what the American bombing has achieved and done mainly, it's actually blocked a possibility that he will escape from these bunkers out. So if this is the case, so actually he's doomed down somewhere about uh, sort of uh, 60, 80 feet down underground. Mr. Shamas, uh, we have read that uh, the Yugoslavs under Marshal Tito and the Germans later built bunkers for Saddam Hussein that could withstand the kind of nuclear weapons that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Is that true? Are, are, there, are there bunkers that are that strong? That's very true. And uh, that's, I wouldn't say that that's, that's actually applying to the all of the bunkers and all of the sort of uh, systems there, but there are some parts of the bunkers or some sections of the bunkers that are being uh, put on uh, layers of springs and uh, modeled rubber which are intended or uh, the purpose is to absorb the shock of nuclear explosion. That's true, yes. I mean, but of course, I mean, uh, a bunker is a bunker, and the great thing about the bunker is the secrecy of the location. Once the location is being revealed, that's already a problem to the people that are inside, because you can bomb it once, you can bomb it twice or three times. At the end, if you bomb it ten times, you are able to penetrate it. Uh, do you think that, uh, that the American military knows the locations of these hardened bunkers? Oh, certainly yes. Certainly, by now, yes. Before the war has begun, they knew part of it, of course, by intelligence, but now when they are inside Baghdad, they certainly know, and as we are talking, actually, there is fighting going inside the tunnels and the bunkers. So at this moment, you would expect there's underground fighting between uh, Saddam Hussein's security force and American troops. That's right. That's actually the information that we got. What is it that you have to do to penetrate these super hardened bunkers? Well, I mean, you should find the secret entrance to it. 
And uh, I don't know, you probably uh, paid attention as well as I paid attention, that even I see some of your correspondents that are in the airport, they briefly showed uh, that they, uh, they, dis they discovered sort of few entrances into these tunnels. Some of these entrances uh, led the forces to a dead end, and some of them brought them really into the, into the heart of the tunnels itself. And then they should begin to move, because the tunnels are all over the town, so you should actually move uh, dozens of miles in order to reach the command post. Is it true that the bunkers are layered? That is, there are bunkers under bunkers? Uh, some of them, yes.